Okay, okay I'll call this meeting to order of the North Township Planning Board, March 7th, 2022. Statement of adequate notice. Adequate notice of this meeting has been provided by the board in preparation of the 2022 annual meeting notice, which sets forth the date, time, and place of this meeting and by properly posting such notice and forwarding the notice to those designated newspapers and persons requesting meeting notices. Moreover, in order to comply with the national and state declarations of the emergency related to COVID-19 pandemic and in accordance with the local land use law, the Open Public Meetings Act and the Emergency Remote Meeting Protocols for local public bodies, this meeting is being held virtually on a web-based platform with remote public access. Would you please all join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. On the roll call, son. Mr. Quillen. Here. Mr. Alessa. Here. Mr. Nunn? Here. Ms. Van Order? Here. Mr. Jorthy? Here. Ms. Murphy? Here. Mr. By? Here. Ms. Wilson? Here. Mr. Flowers? Here. Ms. McKay? Here. Mr. Benoit? Here. Mr. Warner? Here. Mr. Slate? Here. Ms. Laney? Here. And I, Sonia Santiago, here. Okay, thank you. The first item on the agenda is a resolution. Uh, Sonia, do you want to read this? Uh, Mr. Warner. Well, actually, Mr. Warner. Warner. That's okay. It, yeah. yeah, it's the Marks County Housing Authority Resolution Site Plan Waiver Variance. Uh, you'll recall it was uh, courtesy review of a capital improvement project for the installation of five emergency generators within a fenced enclosure to serve uh, the Mars Muse development uh, at 99 Catch Road. A uh, board unanimously granted uh, the uh, project, uh, and that's a current uh, capital improvement project. Uh, we uh, don't make, uh, uh, don't impose or stipulate the conditions of approval. We make recommendations. Recommendations were made primarily with respect to uh, sound testing post installation. Uh, and hopefully the resolution accurately memorializes uh, the board's determinations. And if it does, we can get a motion second and adopt it. Any board members have questions or comments on the, the resolution as written? If not, I'll entertain a motion. To approve? I make a motion to approve. Chief Nunn, motion to approve. Second? I'll second Mr. Chatter. Mr. Quillen? Mr. Quillen, we barely can hear you, okay? Okay, thank you. I second. There thank you. Thank you. On the roll call. Mr. Quillen? Yes. <laughs> Mr. Nunn? Yes. Mr. Alessa? Yes. Ms. Murphy? Yes. Ms. Wilson? Yes. Mr. By? Yes. Mr. Jorthy? Yes. Mr. Flowers? <clears throat> yes. Mr. Benoit? Yes. So move. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I just have one point here. We I don't know about anyone else, but I can't see the meeting room. Um, so I don't know. <clears throat> that camera is uh, not operational tonight. Okay. Yeah, however, if I may, that said, uh, other than uh, three board members, myself, Jim Slate, and means. Sonia Santiago, uh, no one is here, so no one will be presenting any evidence from this room. Uh, so the fact that uh, people cannot see us it, uh, does not uh, render the proceedings deficient in any way, shape, or form. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Mr. Warner. Uh, next item on the agenda, public hearings. 
Um, PBO 620, John and Mary Ann Weisberger. Uh, Sonia? Yes, Mr. Chairman, this is PBO 6 20, John and Mary Ann Weisberger for the minor subdivision with variance. Block 2601, lot 41, 5 Edward Chippen Lane in the RA 130 zone. This is a continuation from December 7 of 2020. You, you don't have to go through all the dates. So. No? no? Okay. <laughs> Public hearings. Applicant proposes a minor subdivision to create one additional lot. Mr. Newmark. Okay. Yes, uh, Ms. Santiago. Uh, can you all hear me? Can you all hear me? Yes. Yes, we can hear you. Oh, good. Okay. Uh, you're not. You're not going to be seeing me because of some technical uh, difficulties. Uh, but Mr. Schomer is here, and he's going to help me with some. Use of some exhibits and uh, well, here we go. You can actually see me, okay? But you won't be seeing me very much because we're going to put an exhibit on the screen through my summation, and uh, I have elected to forego further cross examination of Mr. Steck. Um, so that, that's the situation that the is right now. And, and if I may, Mr. Chairman, very quickly, uh, the uh, so Mr. Newmark, uh, where we had left off, as you you stated, after this is our tenth hearing on this minor subdivision. And uh, we've heard the direct cross and redirect of your engineer, Mr. Schomer, your architect, Mr. Dorn, and uh, your planner, Mr. Schomer. And we also heard direct and redirect, a, a direct cross and redirect of objectors, of witnesses, Mr. Kopp, Mr. Stein, and then uh, his expert, Mr. Steck. Uh, we carried on January 10, 2022, our ninth and last of our meetings. Uh, you were uh, cross-examining Mr. Steck, the objector's planner. Uh, you're, you have no further cross, that's correct? That is correct. I've made that decision to forego okay. further cross. Okay. Mr. Benson, do you have any redirect based on the cross that Mr. Uh, uh, Newmark previously made? I do, but I'll keep it very brief. Please proceed. Could you please elevate Mr. Steck if you haven't already? I can see. Uh, I believe I've already been elevated as a panelist. Great. How are you doing, Mr. Steck? Okay. Okay. So at the last hearing, um, did Mr. Newmark ask you about a declaration by Paul Kof dated December 7, 2020? He did. And I'm going to show you a document now. May I share my screen? Yes. Can you all see my screen? It's coming up. Great. Okay. Is this that document, Mr. Steck? Uh, it is. Okay. Um, and did Mr. Newmark also ask you about Appendix B to this document? He did. Did he suggest that Mr. Cove's declaration and or its Appendix B identified certain lots as the neighborhood in question here? Uh, yes, I believe that was what he was trying to convey, that that was a, a definition of a neighborhood that was um, advanced by Mr. Kof. Okay, and um, can you, where does the declaration address Appendix B? Well, uh, item number five in the declaration references Appendix B. Could you please read that? Yes. Uh, there is not a single lot on Edward Shippen Lane or Jonathan Smith Road where the size of the lot is less than three acres. According to township records, each and every lot on Edward Shippen Lane and Jonathan Smith Road is three acres or more. In fact, all properties on Edward Shippen Lane are more than three acres. I have attached as Appendix B, a chart identifying the owners by lot, block, and address the following, colon, the number of acres, the zoning designation, and whether such owners oppose the zoning variance request. Thank you. Um, so does this paragraph refer to any particular lots as a neighborhood? 
Uh, no, it doesn't use the word neighborhood. It was simply to uh, relay um, certain lots and blocks indicating that they were all over three acres. And uh, according to the author, uh, oppose the proposed two lot subdivision. Okay. And is this Appendix B? Uh, yes. Okay. And uh, what is this? Um, it's a table uh, indicating as announced on item number five, the owner block lot address, the number of acres, uh, the zoning district, and whether or not they oppose the variance request. Uh, there's no mention of a, a neighborhood or a definition of neighborhood or that these uh, items listed constitute a neighborhood. Okay. Um, did you rely on this declaration or its appendix B in reaching the conclusions in your testimony? I did not. Thank you. All right, next I'm going to show you. And before we leave that document, Mr. Chairman, if I may, Mr. Benson, would you concur that uh, whether or not the people were listed as opposing the application on that document, uh, that should be ignored by the board and the board will take the testimony from members of the public uh, when they are under oath uh, as to whether they support or object uh, uh, to the, to the uh, proposal. Would, would you concur with that? Correct. I'm not showing this document um, to show its substance or um, to prove anything other than to uh, to rebut what Mr. Newmark said um, in his questioning. I appreciate that. Mr. Newmark, would you concur as well? I was going to ask you to address that, but you got you're one, one step ahead of me as usual. Yes, uh, I well, do. That, I'll, I'll take that as a yes. Thank you, Mr. Newmark. Please proceed. Thank you. Okay, so I'm gonna show one more document. Um, again, I, I'm not offering this into evidence, um, just using it to rebut uh, what uh, Mr. Newmark asked in his questioning. I can get it open. Okay. Um, so did Mr. Newmark also ask you about the TCC report dated April 22nd, 2019? He did. Is this that document? It is. And did Mr. Newmark point out this particular sentence? Right here. Uh, yes, he did. It was, uh, Item number two on the first page, uh, which Could reads- Could you read that, please? Yes. The TCC noted that given the location of the wetlands and the rear portion of the property, the relief from the front yard setback requirement seemed reasonable. However, the TCC advised the applicant that the existence of, I think it goes on to say wetlands, the existence of wetlands did not provide a basis for the lot area variance. As a result, the TCC encouraged the applicant to provide documentation to the board of existing lot sizes in the immediate neighborhood and principally along Edward Shippen Lane to support the lot area variance request. Thank you. Had the subdivision application been submitted to the TCC when this report was issued? Uh, no, when this was issued, there were two concept plans uh, provided to the TCC, uh, none of which bear a date, which are the plans that were actually submitted for subdivision formally. How do you know that? Well, the, the, the plans that are, uh, first of all, they're referred to as concept plans uh, in, in this TCC document. And, and number two, the plans that were submitted and on the municipal website have a later date. Um, and again, this memo was prepared uh, prior to uh, the start of the hearing. So there was no testimony uh, given when this memo was prepared. And furthermore, as I testified later, uh, the applicant 
uh, miscalculated the uh, variance width uh, because the applicant showed a, width, a lot width um, at the variance setback of 75 feet rather than what the ordinance required as 100 feet back. So this memo is what it is. It's a comment on a concept plan, uh, a plan that was not formally submitted for the application uh, uh, and, uh, and the plan that was form formally submitted um, had a different uh, lot width that should have been calculated. And again, there was no testimony given when the matter was reviewed by the TCC. Okay, uh, moving on to the next issue. Do you remember Mr. Newmark asking you about the description of the proposed subdivision as, quote, gerrymandered? Yes. Is it okay that the proposed lots are not rectangular? Um, they, they Lots don't have to be perfectly rectangular, but these are highly skewed uh, to, in my opinion, uh, jam in two houses. And uh, by the very nature of almost an hourglass shape uh, of the southerly lot, uh, in my opinion, um, it is... Um, uh, not good planning or maybe phrased differently results in substantial uh, impairment of the zone plan and zoning ordinance uh, to have lots of such uh, irregular shape. Now I'd like to ask you about the front yard setback. <clears throat> uh, Mr. Newmark, did he suggest to you that the front yard setback will, will have no impact on anyone? Uh, yes. Um, does the non-compliant front yard setback affect trees? Uh, it does. It, it removes trees, again, that are closer to the front portion of the property. And that's the portion of the property that is most visible from the public street. So by uh, shifting the building envelope by variance to only 75 feet, uh, in my opinion, uh, while some trees need to be removed to construct one house by having uh, two houses and having them shifted toward the street, in my opinion, results <clears throat> in substantial uh, detriment to the public good. And are environmental issues relevant under the MLUL? Uh, yes, it's one of the uh, purposes of zoning is to uh, protect uh, lots or areas that are environmentally sensitive. Uh, this lot is in one sense, the poster child because of the extensive wetlands and the quality of those wetlands. And can the, can the front yard setback be considered in isolation? Uh, it cannot, this is a zone. Uh, the uh, properties across the street and to the south are in the same zone. Uh, the zoning ordinance sets up a minimum standard um, and evaluating whether a variance is warranted or not. It's, in my opinion, essential um, that the board analyze this front setback of the other dwellings. But I, I guess what I'm getting at is, is it proper to consider the front yard setback without the context of the other six variances being sought? Oh, um, it, it is not. This is a composite application. Um, the, to, to consider the front yard setback in isolation doesn't make any sense uh, because the visual impact is substantially different by having two houses on the property rather than one. Okay. Um, and finally, I'd like to ask you about interpretation of C2 variance requirements. Did Mr. Newmark ask you whether the C2 variants liberalize the powers of the planning board? He did. Does the C2 variants liberalize the powers of the planning board? Um, it broadens what the planning board can consider uh, beyond the classic C1 hardship variants, but it's not a free for all. The applicant still has to meet the statutory criterion of showing that the public benefits substantially outweigh the detriments. 
So yes, the rationale uh, was expanded, but the applicant still bur bears the burden of proof. And in my opinion, the applicant has not met that burden. So does that mean that the planning board cannot grant a C2 variance at its discretion? It's, it's, it's not a, a, discre a completely discretional um, a decision of the planning board. It must be based on substantial credible evidence, which in my opinion is not present in the record. And just to be clear, what, what are the criteria necessary for the granting of a C2 variance? Um, the applicant is charged with demonstrating that the uh, benefits substantially outweigh uh, the detriments. Um, and again, uh, there is, first of all, you have to recognize that there is a public benefit, uh, in this case, adding the second house. Um, and then once that benefit is quantified, uh, it must be uh, examined along with uh, detriment to both the public good, such as stormwater runoff, uh, aesthetics, uh, as well as impairment, substantial impairment to the zone plan and zoning ordinance. And the key word in the legislation is substantial. There must be uh, a significant amount of public benefit that allows the board to, um, to accommodate some detriment. And what about MLE? The, what about the purposes of the MLUL? Are those relevant? Those are uh, the courts, of my understanding, have recognized that those public purposes um, represent uh, items that are potentially eligible as public benefits. Do those purposes under the statute need to be advanced? Uh, yes, that's that's the language of the law that that the applicant application approval must advance one or more of those public purposes. And, and again, in the weighing of this, it, the benefits of that advancement must substantially outweigh the detriments. So are you saying that the standard is not just that the variance does not undermine the purposes of the MLUL, rather that those purposes need to be advanced? Yeah, the undermining is the negative criteria in isolation. In this case, there must be a weighing. So the, the, the first part of the analysis is to show how a public purpose is substantially is, is substantially advanced. Okay, and finally, does the applicant meet the criteria for a C2 variance in your opinion? Uh, in my opinion, the applicant has failed to demonstrate um, that a C2 variance is warranted and I conclude, uh, in my own opinion, that if this application is granted, it will substantially impair uh, the intent and purpose of the zone plan and will result in substantial detriment to the public good. Thank you, Mr. Stick. I have no further questions. Uh Mr. Newmark, no recross. I was mooted, I'm sorry, no recross. Okay, thank you. And uh, Mr. Benson, uh, does the uh, neighboring objector uh, rest with their case? No further witnesses, you rest? Uh, no further witnesses. Um, all we have left is our summation. Right. Um, and uh, Mr. Newmark, no rebuttal case? No rebuttal case. Okay. Uh, then, uh, Mr. Chairman, yeah, you're, you are correct. Mem uh, no, member of uh, public, public comment. The, uh, the applicant has rested, the objector has rested, uh, the public comments. I'll swear in all members of the public wish to testify in favor of or against the application, except for those who are represented by council and already testified. Uh, and then we will move to summations, objector summation, then applicant summation, then the board will deliberate and vote. Very good. So at this time, we'll open up this portion of the meeting to public comments. Um, you'll need to be sworn in. 
for comments. And um, I see a hand raised by Ms. Young. Yep. Everyone will have to give their name and address, and then I'll swear you in. As long as I can see you raise your right hand, and then you'll testify. Excuse me, Mr. Chairman or, or Mr. Warner. Can we take this exhibit off of the screen at this point? Oh, apologies. Thank you. Thanks. You brought her in, Jim? Yeah. Let's see. Uh, no, I have to promote her to a panelist. Do you want to do that? Yeah, have to swear in. So we're bringing you in as a panelist. We need you to uh, turn your video on so uh, we can see you to swear you in. <clears throat> Miss Young, Sue Young, I see you're uh, muted and your camera is off. Can you uh, unmute and turn your camera on? All right, so we'll come back to you. Okay, and I'd also like to mention that at this point, if you could keep your comments to five minutes, um, that's probably enough time for you to make significant comments that you'd like to make. Thank you. Seth Lastman, you're uh, being promoted to a uh, panelist to allow you to talk and turn on your camera. Seth, so you should be able to uh, unmute and uh, turn your video on for us. There we go. Okay. You can give us your name and address for the record, please. Yes, Seth Lastman for Edward Shippen Lane. Please raise your right hand. Do you swear to God or affirm that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Please proceed. Yeah, I'm uh, testifying uh, against the motion to grant the variances. Um, I'll keep it brief, similar to what Mr. Steck said. I, I believe there's been no uh, benefit presented that will, you know, benefit the, the surrounding area of the community. Obviously, there's going to be, you know, construction, uh, the runoff that's been discussed, uh, effects to nature, and uh, I just don't see the reasons. You know, Paul and Julie have been here a long time, worked on their homes, same for Manfred. Uh, I, I just don't believe there's any tangible benefit to anyone not financially involved with the Westbergers. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lastman. Thank you. Appreciate it. Do we have Ms. Young, Jim? It looks like she dropped off. I did not see her. I see her hand up. Sue Young's hand? Yeah. She back in the attendees. Yes, she is. So uh, again, we're promoting you to a panelist to allow you to uh, turn your camera on so we can swear you in. Also, if I may just interject very quickly before she begins. I'm not sure whether Mr. Lastman stated this or not, but uh, but he is the owner of four Edward Shipman Lane across the street from Mr. Kof. Yes, thank you. I believe he said that. Hi, right, so we see you. Uh, oh, how, there I am. Okay, there okay. you are. Uh, <laughs> your name and address for the record, please. Uh, my name is Susan Young. I live at 35 Schoolhouse Lane in Morris Township. Okay, please raise your right hand. Do you swear to God or affirm that the testimony about to give us the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Uh, as far as I know, yes, thank you. I appreciate the affirmative response. Please proceed. 
Okay. As I said, I am Susan Young. I'm past Morris Township Environmental Commission chairperson. I started the Ted Lard Largeman Community Garden. I see Mike and Kathy. I hope you're returning gardeners this year. Um, and I served 12 years as president of the Washington Valley Community Association. And I've been a resident of the Valley for 69 years. Our zoning here in Mars in Washington Valley is three acres or less, lesser. We have grandfathered uh, lots on Doe Hill, Indian Head Road and a few scattered other lots. But the whole valley, we consider ourselves to be a neighborhood. The Washington Valley Community Association is alive and well. Edward Shippen Lane in particular is part of the Hayes track of land on Gaston and was subdivided into three acre lots back in the 70s designed for a single home. So I ask why change the zoning rules now? The Weisbergers had to be aware of the zoning when they bought the property. Hello? Oh, um, so why change the rules to suit them? It appears to this casual observer that the Weisbergers initial reason to buy has changed and now they want you, the planning board, to help them make as much money as possible on their transaction. To me, this is not a minor subdivision. You're asking the rest of us residents to allow to disregard the current zoning rules that were set back in the 70s. We all seem to be just fine with the rules as they are. And it seems absurd that the township planning board would even consider squeezing two homes with a lot with such environmental issues. It has three major wetlands all underground on this property. So runoff will be a big issue when the soil is disturbed. No matter how much piping you create for the runoff, the water will seep through the retaining walls that have been designed. It has mature forests and it has quality of the wetlands. There are also steep slopes. I understand Mr. Clint Quinlan visited the site only to sprain his ankle. How many of you have also been to the site? How many, could you raise your hand one? I think the board, the board, the board Ms. Young. Pardon? Ms. Young, can you hear yes. me okay? Steve Warner, yeah. board attorney. I thought that might've been a rhetorical question. Board members are free to visit uh, and they often do. Uh, they prepare themselves for these hearings work very hard as volunteers, as you know, as you do, as you do and did yourself. Yes. But as, if you go to the site, the lay of the land goes straight up, almost like the same steep slopes as Ann Street in Morristown. So given the variances and the setbacks, so much land and soil will have to be disturbed just to create a single buildable lot on this three acres let alone two. And all due respect to Mr. Dorn, he is known for building enormous homes on small lots. And we have three examples of his, his uh, work here in the Valley. I was also surprised to see such um, proposed designs that include such large retaining walls that will be holding back the soil from this hill. It's easy to see rendering on a flat two dimensional piece of paper, but in fact, the property ascends way above the proposed houses. I am asking as a past environmental chair and resident of Washington Valley that this board decline the Weisberger's request to divide the lot into two, keeping it to its original design of three acres and approving only one single home to be built on that lot. I believe that is also the current Environmental Commission's suggestion as well that was in a letter that you were, was sent to you. If you're looking for rateables, one of Mr. Dorn's homes will be not disappointing. The rest of us in the Valley are abiding by the rules that have been set, so we don't see any reason to change the rules for one individual who most likely will not be living here. This is not a hardship case, there is no benefit to have two houses on, these, on this property. So keeping the street as originally designed with three acres and one home, please decline the request for splitting the property. Please allow only one home to be built. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Young. 
Mr. Uh, Chairman, may I, may I question Ms. Young briefly? Yes, go ahead. Mr. Newark? Yeah. Uh, Ms. Young, I have a question for you. I, am I permitted to question Ms. Young at this point? Yes, you are. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Young, would you tell the board what your credentials and so, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. Okay, I, I thought I was interrupted. Can you tell the board what are your qualifications in civil engineering? My qualifications for what? As a civil engineer, do you have such qualifications? No, no. <laughs> How you, you told us that you've been the, I'm, I'm hearing something in the background. I'm sorry. Uh, let me ask you this. Is uh, Doe Hill Road part of the uh, Washington Valley area? Yes. What is the zoning at uh, Doe Hill Road? I think it's anywhere from one acre on, mostly one acre. No, I'm, I'm not asking what the lots are. I'm asking what the zoning is over there. Is, is it not uh, RA 130? Is the zoning for Doe Hill Road RA 130, do you know whether or not that is correct? I do not know. Mr. Chairman? Yes. I have a, I have a, a procedural question. Mr. Jeffrey, yeah. Is it normal for us to question and cross-examine our residents as, as a matter of experts of zoning? I, I can answer that question, uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, with Mr. Chairman, with your permission and, and for, for the mayor, for the benefit of everyone. Uh, the, um, as a uh, quasi-judicial proceeding, uh, the attorneys are allowed to question anyone who gives testimony, be it fact testimony or expert testimony, pursuant to the municipal land use law. Uh, that said, I think, uh, 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 I guess what the applicant's counsel is trying to get at is uh, he was trying to uh, get at the fact that he perceived certain testimony, not to be fact testimony, but to be expert testimony was asking for qualifications as such, but it is uh, permitted under the municipal land use law um, and uh, applicants councils and objectors councils proceed at their own risk. Thank you, Mr. Warren. I have no further questions. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Young. Next up is uh, Leslie Poche. I'm going to, uh, uh, excuse me if I'm butchering your last name, but uh, promote you to a panelist so you can turn on your video and audio. Poche? 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 Good evening, I'm Leslie Poche. You got my name correct. Oh, yeah. Very good. Sorry. And your address? Um, I live at 14 Jonathan Smith Road. I'm at least half a mile by road um, to the lot being discussed. Would you be kind enough to raise your right hand, please? Do you swear to God or affirm that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? It is. Thank you I very do. much. Thank you. Please proceed. Thank you. Um, I am a resident in the immediate environment, but my lot does not touch the lot. Um, and I am a homeowner on, on my property. Um, I object to the request of so many variances um, for basically what is currently one lot. Uh, my primary interest is environmental for the neighborhood. We have um, a lot of water on the neighborhood. Several creeks run through the neighborhood. Uh, personally, I have a dry run and a spring that ends up as a creek. I, I know a lot of the neighbors have had to have houses placed or deal with water runoff. Um, the wetlands, therefore, even though my lot doesn't directly touch this property being discussed, um, are, are a concern. Um, I am concerned not just because of the immediate effect of water running onto a road or something like that, but I think it's going to affect neighboring properties. And I attended some of the earlier meetings where it was discussed how that that could be mitigated. And I know engineers can do wonderful things, 
but I am very concerned with the additional request of a variance um, to change where a, pro a, a residence, a, a structure would be placed. Um, the, the reality is I think that practically speaking, when um, there is a significant wetland portion to a property, um, whether it's moving water or more of a swampy situation, you are limited in use if it's not completely unusable. And so the amount of property remaining to actually be built upon becomes much less, whether it's you know a home with a deck, a home with a patio, other structures are, some of our neighbors have put all sorts of recreational structures on their property. And I think a lot of people who think that they're getting a two to three acre piece of land are imagining that they will be able to use a large part of that land. And so I have concern that the wetlands wouldn't be maintained. Um, then the, the other concern, and, and I know that's about who the buyers are, which cannot be guessed at. Um, but that concern about that transition area that we just saw in a document, that is also an, an issue. There's a variance request for that. Um, and then I think the point that has already been brought up, the size of the houses, um, I think that the houses that I saw were extremely large. One was definitely larger and built right up to existing neighbors um, property lines uh, as much as could be done. And the idea that someone would build a second whole second floor and not put any rooms in there and put you know their four children or however many down in the basement where they'd have easy access in and out just that's not a reasonable structure. They're gonna put bedrooms upstairs like everybody else. Um, so I just have a lot of questions about the way that the structures are being planned. So thank you for listening to my opinion. Okay, thank you, Ms. Poche. Next up is Elliot Baines. If you can turn your uh, mic and camera on, please, so we can swear you in. There go. Okay, there we are. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, we can. Uh, full name and address, please. Elliot Baines, 1 Jonathan Smith Road in the township. Thank you. Please raise your right hand. Do you swear to God or affirm that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you very much. Please proceed. Yes, I'm, I just want to reiterate some of the points that have already been made, basically about this variance request not being a hardship case, but rather one that um, requires showing a substantial benefit for changing from the existing RA-130 uh, zoning rules that have been in place for, for many years. Um, the, the main argument uh, from the petitioners seems to be, hey, these two houses won't be so bad. The plans that we put together or the preliminary plans aren't those nice looking houses, but that doesn't rise to the level of being a substantial benefit to the area. And so I would ask the board to reject the application based on the fact that it's not a substantial improvement by, by any measure. Thank you very much. Hey, thank you, Mr. Baines. Next up is uh, Mike Philbrick. If you can uh, turn on your mic and camera, we'll, we're promoting you to a panelist. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Can you raise your right hand, please? You swear to God or affirm that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I do. Thank you very much. Name and address for the record, please. Mike Philbrick, 2 Jonathan Smith Road in Morris Township. Please proceed. I'll, I'll be brief because uh, much like many of my neighbors, I don't want to waste the committee's time and by uh, repeating. But just to start, I object to this application. I think believe it sets a dangerous precedent 
for our large, our, our neighborhood. I've walked down Edward Chippen many times. I mean, to the point others have made maintaining the wetlands there is essential to this neighborhood. And the last thing I'll say is in addition to cutting down of almost 20 trees, I know I've spent the last year or so in the nice weather zipping around all the, uh, the contractors that the town had to hire to get rid of all the ash trees and to cut down 20 more trees in the name of multiple zoning variances. I just, it doesn't bring anything to our neighborhood. And for that, I object to the application. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Filbert. Next up is Jane, James Muchmore. Promoting you to a panelist, if you can turn on your mic and camera, please. We see you just need your uh, microphone turned off. You're still muted. There we go. Perfect. Okay. The, uh, please raise your right hand. Do you swear to God or affirm that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do, sir. Thank you very much. Name and address for the record, please. Um, uh, Dr. James H. Muchmore, and I live at 57 Gaston Road. Please proceed. So I live down downhill of the Steens and uh, Mr. Glassman. And in the last uh, two, three years, there's been more and more uh, runoff of water from this property. And given the nature of this property, because I'm familiar with wetlands. I lived in New Orleans where I was six feet below sea level. But uh, I think th th the water runs off of the property on Shippen Lane all year round and it's uphill. And, uh, and the other thing that I've noticed over the last eight, nine, 10 years is some of the, some of the area in the middle of the wetlands has been sinking. So uh, to disturb more the sub uh, surface of this area is just going to increase the amount of water flow through through all of these different properties. So and again, and I speak more as an environmentalist and familiar with wetlands. That's all. That's all I need. That's all I uh, want to add. And thank you, Mr. Muchmore. Next up is uh, Brian uh, Gaffney. And again, we're promoting you to a panelist so you can turn on your camera and microphone. Is that there I am? Can you yeah. see me? We, we yes. can, thank you. If you could raise your right hand, please. Um, do you swear to God or affirm that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. Thank you. Please give your name and address and then proceed. Uh, I'm Brian Gaffney. I am at 12 Jonathan Smith Road. Uh, I'm not, at, I'm not at, uh, I don't border on the property, but I would be able to see it from my backyard. Uh, my objection is, is simple. I just think these, you know, we have, um, we have zoning laws, and um, this is a lot of variance, a lot of variances to grant, um, and I don't think that they should be granted. I think it's a uh, it's a problematic precedent to be set. Um, this, you know, priced into the price of this lot was the fact that it was it it was not uh, legally allowed to uh, build these two structures on it, uh, and um, I think it should remain that way. That's it. Thank you, Mr. Gaffney. 
I see no further uh, hands raised. If uh, that's it, Mr. Mr. Chairman, I more, then we'll close the public comment period. We're double checking, uh, Jim. No further. Still no further comment. No, no, no further no. hands. Okay. Raised. And Mr. Okay. Chairman, we're, uh, uh, we've closed the public portion. We've closed the testimony. We're now at the point where there'll be submissions, as is the usual course. The neighboring objectors council would provide his summation first, then the applicant's council will provide his summation, uh, and then the board will deliberate and vote. Mr. Mr. Warner and, and Chairman, <clears throat> may I make a request before we proceed to summations? Yes, Mr. Lamar. Several of the members of the public raised issues associated with water and problems associated with water. And perhaps before hearing Mr. Benson and myself, neither of us being engineers, perhaps Mr. Slate would weigh in at this point and let us know if he has the same concern. The, uh, uh, that's up to the chair, uh, if, if the chair wishes that to occur. Uh, normally we'd have summations and the deliberation of vote, but uh, uh, board members can uh, ask professionals at any time for uh, opinion. Uh, so that's up to the chair. Uh, if I may, I, I'd like to object to that. I would prefer that we stick to the, the normal procedure, but of course I will defer to the chair. Does, you know, it does to some extent reopen testimony, even if it's coming from a board professional, Mr. Chairman. So the- uh, uh, I see what you mean, right. I believe well, the board I professionals weighed in throughout the hearing. It's understood that these are public comments. They're not, from, they're not from professionals. It's the viewpoint of the individuals themselves. And the board understands that. And we'll take those comments from the public um, for what there are members of the public who have concerns and observations throughout their period there, but they're not from professional licensed people. So if we're moving to uh, deliberation, uh, summations, Mr. Chairman, it's the uh, neighboring objectors council, Mr. Benson, then applicants council, Mr. Newmar. May I proceed? Yes, please do. Um, and also, may I share my screen again? Yes, I'm covering ahead. Yes. Um, I put together a demonstrative exhibit that I would like to share with all of you as I give my summation. Is this a new exhibit? Because I think we left off at uh, Objectors Exhibit 21 was the last Objectors Exhibit. Yes, this is a new exhibit, so I guess it would be 22. Okay, but it's not coming in through any testimony, correct? No, correct. I'm, I'm not using this um, to offer the, the substance of, of this document. I'm offering this only um, as a, a summary of what I'm about to say to you. Right, so it'll uh, be identified as O22, but it's not going to be uh, to the extent we abide by informal rules of evidence. Of course, we're quasi-judicial. It will not be introduced into evidence. It'll just be for illustrative or, or reference purposes. Please proceed. Thank you. So board members, <clears throat> as was demonstrated by the, the testimony you've heard in this hearing, the applicant simply does not meet the criteria for the seven variances it's seeking. And the applicant is actually creating the need for the seven variances. It's creating the need by demanding two homes on one lot, even though it admits it could build just one home on this lot without a single variance. Why is the applicant doing this? Uh, clearly to maximize the return on its investment in the property. But as you know, maximum profit is not a justification for a variance. So let's take a final look at the applicant's case. The applicant's professionals have expressly stated that the applicant is not claiming a hardship and that the applicant thus is not seeking a C1 hardship variance. 
the applicant is seeking only C2 variances, seven of them. Um, and the criteria for a C2 variance are these, according to the statute, as you've heard throughout the hearing. Uh, one, the purposes of the municipal land use law must be advanced by the deviation. And two, the benefits of the deviation must substantially outweigh any detriment caused by the deviation. Here, it's obvious that the application does not advance any purpose of the MLUL and doesn't benefit anyone except the applicant. Um, now, for that reason, applicant's planner twisted the C2 variants in his testimony. And to be clear, I'm referring to Mr. Schomer. In his testimony, he asserted that the deviations here do not undermine the purposes of the MLUL. But that's not the standard. The standard, again, is that the deviation must advance the purposes of the MLUL, and also that the benefits of the deviation must substantially outweigh any detriment caused by the deviation. Um, so let's examine the specific purposes uh, of the MLUL that were addressed in Mr. Schomer's testimony. First, public health, safety, morals, and general welfare. Any suggestion that the general public benefits from the subdivision of this one residential lot into two lots is, is obviously absurd. Um, the people most impacted by the proposed subdivision are the current residents of Edward Ship and Lane. And they all oppose this application as you've heard. Mr. Stein, Mr. Lastman, Mr. Kof um, and their families. And in addition to them, we've heard from numerous other objectors who live on the neighboring roads and they are all opposed to this application. So it's hard to see how the public health, safety, morals and general welfare are being advanced here. Next, safety from flooding. The construction of two homes instead of one clearly does not increase safety from flooding. If anything, it exacerbates stormwater runoff on an already wet property. Um, and as you've heard, this is a serious concern for my clients and for the other people who live in the area, um, but particularly for my clients who live next door and across the street from the applicant's property. Um, they are already impacted signif significantly by runoff and also by a high water table. So again, clearly this application does not advance the purpose of safety from flooding. Next, adequate light, air, and open space. Building two houses instead of one on one lot obviously does not increase the amount of light, air, and open space. It decreases it. Period. Next, appropriate population densities. The township itself has determined through its ordinances and its master plan that the appropriate density in this zone is no more than one house per three acres. Nonetheless, the applicant demands a higher density for, excuse me, demands a higher density for its property, namely one house per 2.8 acres. Um, and the actually, actually the applicant is also creating a higher density beyond its own property. Whereas the other homes in the area are spaced out, the higher concentration of homes created by this subdivision would result in the adjacent COF home sharing a roughly two acre area with the two proposed homes. So again, this application is not advancing the purpose of appropriate population densities. It's undermining it. Next. Desirable visual environment. Seven variances by definition undermine the harmony of the neighborhood's layout. Um, as I mentioned, the gerrymandered subdivision results in a clustering of homes that clashes with the rest of this neighborhood, which is well proportioned. In fact, the applicant was unable to identify any other property in the area that needed a variance. And the pre-existing homes on Edward Ship and Lane actually exceed the zoning minimums. On the other hand, the applicant proposes seven variances. And this is not to mention that the applicant had to, the applicant had to turn one of the proposed houses sideways in order to avoid an eighth variance for a side yard setback. Last, environmental. 
everyone here agrees that this property is an environmentally sensitive area. And construction of two homes instead of one would of course increase, if not double, the amount of disturbance and impervious surface in this environmentally sensitive area. And it would do so against the recommendation of the Township Environmental Commission, which the applicant has not contested. It would do so despite DEP's designation of the wetlands on the property as having exceptional resource value. And despite DEP's finding that there are threatened and or endangered species in the area. And despite the EPA's designation of one of the wetlands as priority wetlands. So clearly I've given you now a list of detriments and not benefits. Um, so even in a strong case, it would be hard to find benefits numerous and strong enough to outweigh all these detriments. And what do you, what, what does the public get here to justify all of these detriments? What benefits does it get? According to the applicant, the public gets an assurance of beautiful architecture from Peter Dorn. But an assurance of beautiful architecture is legally irrelevant. The architecture won't be any less beautiful if only one house is built instead of two. So clearly the applicant falls woefully short in meeting the C2 variant standard. Finally, I'd like to note that the applicant has gone to great lengths to suggest that each of the seven variances is reasonable in isolation. But the applicant is not seeking one variance in isolation, it's seeking seven variances. And those seven variances need to be considered together in their totality. The reason seven variances are necessary is that the proposed mm -hmm. subdivision is flawed in seven different ways, not just one way. And the applicant is proposing such a flawed project in a neighborhood that is highly compliant with the applicable zoning restrictions. Frankly, in this well-spaced park-like neighborhood, the applicant's proposed project would stick out like a sore thumb. So for all those reasons, my clients respectfully request that you deny the approval sought by the applicant. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Benson. Mr. Lumak? Mr. Newmark, you're on mute. Okay, forgive me. Um, I'm going to ask uh, Mr. Schomer, who is assisting me, to put on the screen the exhibit that was on the screen at the last meeting. I believe it's it was the objectors exhibit 21. Um, but uh, Mr. I'm going to leave it up to Mr. Schomer to get it on the screen, and uh, because I'm going to make reference to it uh, during my summation. Okay. All right. Can can everyone see that? Yep. Can can everyone see the exhibit that's on the screen now? Yes. Is it? Everybody can. The answer is yes. Yes. Okay, good. Thank you very much. Let me, let me then proceed. And first, I want to say that we appreciate the time of the board and its professionals that have been devoted to this application over the, the many, many months uh, when we started out. And we also appreciate, and I, I'm sincere about this, we also appreciate the cooperation of the objectors and, and their counsel. It's, it's helpful when people work together with respect to scheduling and, and things of the like. Passing on from that. This application requests permission to take a lot that is 5.0 acres in size and subdivide it into two acres each, each of which will be 2.81 acres in size. The zoning ordinance requires each lot to be three acres in size. Each of the proposed lots will be deficient by only 6.3%, but variance relief is, is therefore necessary. So we're gonna be asking you to grant variances with respect to those two lots that are deficient by 6.3% or 0.19 acres, however you want to look at it. And I would respectfully suggest, and we'll talk more about it later, but uh, those are what lawyers like to call de minimis 
situations. They don't, they don't, they're not substantial. They're not meaningful, but those are two of the seven variances that we are requesting. That takes two of them. 6.3% less than what the ordinance would require. Although, although the ordinance requires the homes on the lots to be set back a hundred feet from the, from the street, the setbacks that are being proposed are only going to be 77 and 75 feet from the, from the, the street line. And I will perhaps refer to them as 75 feet in each case, just because it's easier to do that. Now, looking at the exhibit, uh, I think you can see the two houses that are proposed and shown where they would be located if this application were granted. And with respect to the one on the south, and uh, Mr. Schomer is putting his cursor around that house right now, and that of course, that of course is the house that would be closest uh, to Mr. Koff. And as you can see, it is indeed 77 feet from the street line. It is supposed to be 100 feet from the street line. Uh, given the configuration of the road, it's hard for me to understand how that 23 foot deviation is at all meaningful to anyone, the immediate neighborhood or the, or the more substantial neighborhood. But we'll, we'll go on. <clears throat> Excuse me. The ordinance requires lot widths at the street to be 300 feet. One of the proposed lots, and that is the, uh, the one most northerly, that's the, the one that's separated from Mr. Koff's property. And Mr. Schof is going to tell you what where that is. He's going to show you where that is. <clears throat> the, the the width at the street line is only 262 feet, where the ordinance requires it to be 300 feet. Now, perhaps somebody can explain to me why that deviation is significant or meaningful or could possibly cause any harm to anyone or anybody's property values. It just doesn't make sense to me. The ordinance requires that the lot width measured at the front yard setback be 300 feet and proposed lot 41 is going to be only 270 feet wide at the, at the, at the, set foot, at the, at the setback line. Uh, and again, I suggest that that is uh, a, a minimus deviation and should not be of great concern to anybody. And of course, this all goes to the, the negative criteria that we'll, we'll talk about now. The ordinance requires a lot widths measured from 40 feet behind the front yard set back to be 300 feet. One of the proposed lots, namely 4101, that's the one next to uh, Mr. Cove, uh, will only be 238 feet wide when you get to 40 feet behind the uh, 75 foot setback. Again, once again, uh, Mr. Mr. Schomer, would you kind of show with your cursor that dimension, that 230 foot dimension? running across there, that's 238 feet. Respectfully, I don't know how anybody can be caused harm with respect to their property, property value, the welfare of the neighborhood, because that width is deficient by 22 feet. A lot of time was spent listening to Mr. Poff and Mr. Stack testify regarding the necessary NJDEP approvals. As he, as Mr. Benson conceded, and as he said many, many times, if the board approves the application, the applicant's going to have to go down to Trenton to deal with the EP and either get an approval for them or not get an approval from them. So your approval of this application would certainly be subject to those approvals. And excuse me, I'm going to take a drink of water. Mr. Steck argued, as you may, may recall, Mr. Steck argued that the application should have gone to the NJDEP before coming to this board. He cited section 22 of the MLUL in support of that argument. Section 22 allows the board to condition relief on subsequent DEP approval. Nothing in that section of the MLUL requires an applicant to get DEP approval prior to coming to the plan. And if I'm incorrect, in that respect, I trust Mr. Warner will correct. Mr. Cuff also pointed out that we have failed to show that we are suffering a hardship. And again, Mr. <clears throat> me, Council uh, acknowledged that we have never said that we're seeking a hardship variance because we are not suffering a hardship. 
but there's an entirely different section of the MLUL that allows for this board to grant dimensional variances without respect to any hardship whatsoever. And you've heard Mr. Benson talk about it, or Mr. Cole, or Mr. Schomer talk about it, or Mr. Steck talk about it. And we're talking about the C2 variance that was adopted by the legislature in the sometime in the 1980s. And the intent of the legislator, and I questioned Mr. Steck about it by quoting from the Cox Treatise, which everybody accepts as authoritative, the fact that the <clears throat> C2 variance was introduced into the zoning law in order to provide boards with greater discretion and the ability to grant relief when it's appropriate in accordance with the standards set forth in the statute under C2 criteria. But the legislature at that time decided that limiting dimensional relief where there could only, where there could not be shown a hardship was a disservice to people who had legitimate reasons for deviating that would cause no harm and, and would provide some benefit. And that what was introduced to the law in, in the 1980s, it's been referred to ever since as the flexible C variance. And it allows this board to, uh, to be flexible and treat the ordinance as flexible in order to do proper zoning analysis and provide appropriate zoning relief uh, when it finds that that relief is, is justified. Mr. Benson and some of the neighbors uh, obviously disagree with me, but I think we have demonstrated- Sorry, Mr. Newmark, we can't hear you. Sorry? We couldn't hear you. That, that's better. Can you hear me now? I'm sorry. I, I know what I did, I'm not gonna do it again. I just not spill my water. <laughs> so let, let's talk about the negative impact that is suggested by the neighbors, the objectors, and Mr. Benson. And frankly, in this case, in every C2 case, the board has to address the positive criteria, some public benefit, and balance it against the negative impact, if any. And I, I've always been of the view that the negative impact is the much more relevant consideration in dealing with these kinds of sometimes very difficult cases. So I'm gonna address the negative aspects uh, before I talk about the affirmative one. <clears throat> Regarding the undersized lots, as I said, they're only deficient by 6.3%, which in a three acre zone is, and I, I believe in my, view, in my view is trivial. The relevance of the size of the lots relate to whether adding these two lots to the existing 11 developed lots in the list of properties that Mr. Kof provided will result in excessive density in the neighborhood. The evidence has shown that if the subdivision is approved, the average of the lot sizes in those 11 properties that are most nearby this one will be 3.6 acres, slightly over the required three acre lot size. The approval of this application will not have a meaningful or substantial negative impact on the overall density of this neighborhood. Mr. Steck agreed with Mr. Schomer that a conforming home could be developed on the 5.6 acre lot and that the location of the home on the conforming lot could be in the same approximate location as the home that we now propose to be on lot 41.01. Again, that's the lot uh, next to Mr. Cole. Given that, I asked Mr. Steck whether the real issue in this application is whether the necessary variances which would allow a home to be built on the 2.8 acre proposed lot 41 could possibly, and that's the, the one farther away from Mr. Cove. I asked him whether the real issue in this application is whether the necessary variances which would allow a home to be built on the 2.8 acre proposed lot 41 could possibly have a substantial negative detrimental impact on the Kauf property, the Stein property, or any other properties in the Edward Shippen Lane neighborhood. I believe he either dodged that question or argued that somehow it would cause harm. And if you agree with Mr. Steck that the proposed creation of lot 41, 400 feet away from the Stein home and separated from Mr. Coff's home by the home we proposed on 41.01, if that is gonna result in a substantial detriment or if this board finds it would result in a, in a substantial 
negative detriment, then you're, you're going to deny this variance. I, I frankly don't see how anyone could agree with Mr. Stack's analysis in that regard. The, the lot 41 property requires three variances. And we've been told repeatedly that this application should be denied because there are seven variances, but none of them are of any great significance. None of them will cause any significant or meaningful harm taken independently, taking them lot by lot, taking them uh, in totality, any way you look at this most respectively. And I think that uh, Mr. Mr. Schofer made this case and I don't think that uh, Mr. Steck really adequately rebuffed it. And that is on proposed lot 41, we're gonna be 75 feet from the street. And Mr. Schomer is helping us identify that. Now, if, if, if any, anybody, <laughs> That's, that's listening to me can tell me how that deficiency of 25 feet is going to have an impact on anyone, any place. It simply does not make logical sense. The property is an unusual shaped property. Unusually shaped properties frequently call for the exercise of discretion by zoning boards and planning boards to provide relief because the irregular shape of property requires relief in certain instances. And this is most respectfully one of those interest instances. So we're 75 feet away from the street on lot 41. Does that harm anyone? I don't think it does. We have 2.81 acres on lot 41 deficient by less than 7%, 0. 0.19 of an acre deficient. Respect would anybody driving down that cul-de-sac, walking down that cul-de-sac, flying over that cul-de-sac, recognize the deviation of, a, of the lot area, recognize the deviation of the distance from the street to the house, or <clears throat> with respect to the, uh, the lot with the, the variance that's required? Uh, I, I don't think so. I don't think so. I think what's more important is the relationship be between the house that's proposed on lot 41 to the house that's proposed on 41.01. .01. And Mr. Schomer is flying over those so that we both, we all know what I'm referring to. And as you can see, the lot 41 house, Russie, is, and it's not, the dimension is not there, but uh, I'm sure you remember that that proposed house is 50 feet away from the common, common property line, which separates lot 41 from 4101. And I'm gonna take another drink of water. And the importance of that can't be, can't be overlooked. The ordinance requires properties to be <clears throat> from, the, from the sidelines 50 feet. And that being the case where you're putting together homes on lots that are next to each other, those homes, according to the ordinance, are supposed to be 50 feet from each other. And in this case, the property, the, the, the home that's proposed on lot 41 from the home that's proposed on lot 4101 is 50 feet plus 50 feet is 100 feet. And that's the important dimension that properties should not be on top of each other or homes should not be on top of each other. The fact that the lot 41 is 2.81 acres as opposed to three acres is insignificant and it's just not important. Uh, and, and the same with respect to the setback of 75 feet, it's, it doesn't cause harm from it for anyone. It would not be discernible to anyone. It's not gonna result in a slippery slope. It's not gonna cause a domino effect. It's just gonna be there and someone will live there and enjoy living there. And they'll be a hundred feet away from their neighbor at 41.04. Now with respect to the distance between the, the, the house that's proposed on lot 4101, uh, from the neighbor, Mr. Cobb, uh, and that dimension there is on the diagram, is on the, uh, the exhibit, is 132 feet. And I think that Mr. Steck corrected us all, uh, even though it was his exhibit, that the real dimension should be 50 feet plus, 20, plus 77 feet, or a total of 127 feet. So whereas the ordinance ordains for the protection of property owners so that they're not on top of each other with respect to the, their dwellings. It's supposed to be 100 feet from each other. This one, these two houses will be 127 feet from each other. So 
the development of lot 41 as proposed respectfully, without all due respect to Mr. Steck and Mr. Benson, that lot 41, all three variances, take them one at a time, take them three out of three, take them 2.2 out of three, any way you want to look at them, they don't amount to a hill of beans. They're not important. So for purposes of weighing the negative impact against any positive effect, there is very little on the negative side of the ledger with respect to what's proposed on lot 41. How in the world can the development of lot 41 as proposed have an impact on the property that's gonna be one property away from it, Mr. Cove, or two properties away from it, Mr. Drisciardi, or the property across the street from Mr. Uh, that's gonna be, that's occupied and owned by Mr. Mr. Stein. Lot 41, is what's being is the variance that we're really asking for. That's that's really the relief. That's the second house that the ordinance, if strictly applied, would not permit us to to use. And it does not impact any of the surrounding properties. Will not cause any detriment to the public good. Will not have any conceivable impact on the zone scheme. So as you look at those three variances, and if you if 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 you as a majority of you say that none of those three variances are, are, are appropriate or, or make good sense, then you're gonna deny the application. I don't see how you can come to that conclusion. So now we're down to, uh, to a few more variances. And excuse me one, one more time, I'm, I need to take a drink of water. I'll be with you in a moment. Forgive me. I'm looking at my notes and trying to make this shorter, actually, if you believe that. Mr. Steck also testified that the variance required for the 70 foot, 75 foot setback uh, and for the 2.81 lot area variance for lot 4101 were unjustified. The ordinance, of course, calls for 100 foot setbacks from the street. The proposed 77 setback, 77 foot setback on lot 4101 requires a 23 foot dimensional variance. And as we discussed with respect to lot 41, the 2.81 lot area variance is, is a result of us being 6.3% deficient from the three acre minimum, also requiring variance relief. Again, if you if you look at uh, lot 4101, Rusty, this is make sure everybody knows what we're talking about. Would there be, would, would anybody object to that if the lot was 0.19 acres larger and, and therefore conform? The, the, the difference between the, what we have and what we need is again, what lawyers refer to as de minimis. We love our lot de minimis. It means trivial and it is trivial. The same goes for the, the 77 foot setback on lot 4101, again, because of the unusual configuration Mr. Mark, of the road. Mr. Mark, I'm sorry, but this is, it seems to me this is getting a little repetitive. You've already made these particular points. Do you have I, I, more I, I, points? I'm speaking of. Okay, sorry, this is the chairman. Mr. Newmark, that was the chairman. Are you about ready to hone in on the end of your summation? Well, I, I, I was, I, no, the, the answer to that is, is I not, but if you're tired of listening to me, I suppose I can cut it short. I'm, I'm no, no, a I, believe the chair, I believe the chairman noted that there may have been some repetition and in fairness to the volunteer board, it may be appropriate to move forward. Well, why don't, why don't you give me a couple of minutes to look at my notes and I'll try to cut it short. Okay, okay. thank you. Thank you. I, I will proceed uh, as suggested, if I may. Please do. Thank you very much. Okay, so we, we apparently I've beaten to death the whole negative impact uh, issue. And so I'm gonna move on uh, to the positive criteria because in addition to demonstrating that 
what is being proposed and the variances are required, if, a grant, if they're granted will cause no harm, we of course have to show you that there is some benefit resulting from this approval. And again, it's not necessarily benefiting the people next door or around the corner. It's benefiting in the sense that it's a, it, you, we own property subject to the exercise of police power by the municipalities. And we live with that. But there are times when strict adherence to the rules just doesn't, it isn't fair and just doesn't make sense. So we have the, the, the we're entitled to seek variances and to demonstrate to the board that the variance release is consistent with what the law allows. So I think that we have provided proof that the approval of this application will advance several of the purposes of zoning found in the MLUL. The first one is subsection A in the purposes of zoning. And that is to encourage action to guide the appropriate use of land. This substantial, almost six acre, six acre lot, oversized lot, if it would be devoted to one house, will be put to a protect, pr productive and permitted use as a second home site in substantial conformity with the dimensional requirements contemplated by the ordinance. And that respectfully is a benefit in the zoning planning sense. Next, we come to subsection E, which allows for the appropriate establishment of population densities. Here, the shortfall in each case is not significant. And if the variances are approved, the overall average density of the neighborhood will still exceed three acres as contemplated by the ordinance and the master plan, keeping in mind that the deficiency with respect to lot sizes is only 6.3%. Subsection I, to promote a desirable visual environment through creative development techniques and good civic divine design. Uh, we are committed to developing each of the lots with homes that are clearly compatible with the size and design of the homes in the neighborhood. Anyone buying into the neighborhood will be assured of the size and design of the homes proposed on these two lots. If the property is developed as one lot, it'll likely be sold to a developer who will build we don't know what, uh, whereas now you know what you were, you're going to get. That respectfully is a significant benefit to the neighborhood because it eliminates a question mark at the end of Edward Ship and Lane. If someone is going to buy a property in that neighborhood, they, they would look at a vacant lot right now and perhaps pause not knowing what the future holds for that property. Well. If this application is granted, and unless somehow you're offended by the the architecture, which uh, I, I think is it's hard to it's hard for me to think that that would be objectionable to anyone, but the size of the homes was demonstrated by the information that was supplied to the board with respect to lot sizes, with respect to home sizes, and that these two houses that are proposed would be compatible. So we think that that is a benefit as considered by the MLUL in considering that the purposes of zoning in particular, the desirable visual environment uh, is a positive that you put on the positive side of the scale. I think we've shown that there will be no meaningful substantial negative impacts if the variances are approved. We've also shown that the additional lot requested is consistent with the desired density even though it is slightly deficient. If the second lot is approved, it will be put to a productive use, which is what subsection A of uses, the purpose of, of zoning is all about. This is a perfectly appropriate use of the 2.1 acre parcel, lot 41. I think we've also shown that the productive use of the proposed additional lot will be consistent with the density in the area. Respectfully, I, I think that we have made the case uh, it'll be up to you to decide whether you agree with the neighbors or whether you agree with the applicant that the proposal as you find it and as shown on this diagram is not going to have any negative impact. Uh, I, I didn't really get a chance to discuss the variances for the width of the lot at the, at the, at the setback line and 40 feet beyond it, and they are deficient by 
Instead of 300 feet, I think one's 270 feet, another one's 230 feet. That's a, that's a, that's a long way. 230 feet is a significant width. It's not what the ordinance calls for. But in this situation, I think the deviation is justified. I want to thank you once again for your patience with me. I tend to talk longer than I should, uh, but uh, that's just what I do. Thank you again, and uh, I'll be interested in hearing your comments. Thank you, Mr. Newmark. Mr. Chairman, if uh, we're ready now for deliberations and vote, uh, and I'll try to be brief as well. The uh, Just a reminder to everyone, it's a minor subdivision, two lots to one, excuse me, one lot to two uh, is the proposal. Uh, and uh, bulk variances, seven of them, two lot areas, three lot widths, uh, and two front yard setback deviations for the proposed lots. The, uh, this board has spent 10 hearings on this matter, given the applicant five hearings for direct case and four and a half hearings for the objector's case. And now the uh, summations and conclusions, certainly this volunteer board has provided due process to both the applicant, the neighboring objectors and the members of the public uh, and has uh, provided a substantial amount of accommodation to everyone involved. Um, the, uh, and I'm also, uh, the board has a heck of a, an attendance record too. Uh, the, um, we have nine board members this evening uh, who have been present for or uh, certified that they uh, heard the one, in each case only one uh, uh, meeting that they missed over the last 10 hearings going back to December 7, 2020. Um, and uh, so uh, we do have a full complement to decide this case. Uh, a majority, five out of four, excuse me, five out of nine will decide whether the uh, application is granted or not, rather than go through all the conditions uh, of approval that were stipulated to by the applicant. I think it makes sense for the board to deliberate first. And I could always do that in the event we're uh, going to have an approval. Uh, but uh, it makes sense, I think, for deliberations first to see where the board, which direction the board is going. Um, so it's time for that, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Warner. Um, yeah, at this point, let's go into deliberations. I'd like to have deliberations and comments and observations and viewpoints before throwing out a resolution one way or the other. I think it's important to the applicant as well as to the objectors that we and discuss the reasons that we are going to vote the way we're going to vote. And I see Mr. Russell's hand up. Mr. Chairman, is it appropriate to ask our professionals questions or are we just uh, discussing this among ourselves? At this point, we're just discussing this among ourselves. I, I just have a comment then. Um, a little tough of an application. You have some homeowners in the area that are not happy with the applicant. Um, they've told us their feelings loud and clear. Uh, but I also look at the greater picture of what's best for the township. Um, also, the uh, need for housing. And uh, my comment would be that if the applicant were to decide to put an 8,000 square foot house on his lot and cut down the trees to build a pool, we wouldn't stop him. So uh, I'm you know, inclined to listen to what the other board members have to say, but that's a, a feeling that I wanted to express. Okay, thank you, Mr. Wesso. Any other board members? Ms. Wilson? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So I spent some time today reviewing the MLUL purposes um, and the criteria for um, making our vote. And in my opinion, the, um, I do not see how this variance would advance the purpose of the MLUL, the A through O purposes. Um, I don't see public benefits in this application. I see benefits to the applicant, but I do not see benefits to the public. I'm very concerned about the wetlands and the environmentally sensitive areas. I note that in Mr. Newmark's comments, when he was talking about the 
um, the, uh, the disadvantages, there was no mention of water. I'm very concerned about um, water. I do believe that in one of our meetings, a couple meetings ago, there was mentioned that there's a stream that goes right through the property, which I was looking in my notes. I don't see somebody was going to look into that. I don't have uh, an update on that, where that started and where it goes, but there's a lot of water here. There's um, uh, changes in the rules needed for how close the, the transition area um, that, you know, the, the applicant would uh, need to get approval from DEP. I'm very uncomfortable weighing in on this application without hearing anything from DEP. I agree with our environmental commission that um, the, the, you know, the wetlands concerns, I do not see the benefits outweighing the disadvantages. And um, I do see benefit or I do see detriment to the public good. So um, I am inclined to uh, vote against this application. Mr. Bai. Yes, I would agree. I'm also inclined to vote against this application. I, uh, I do not see the great public benefits. Uh, they're at best seem to be a wash to me. They're, they don't advance things over a single family house. Um, yes, there are possibilities that a single family house could be a uh, home could be built that was worse <laughs> than these two in the eyes of anybody and the homeowners. But, you know, there's no assur assurance of that either. Um, I agree that the lot is unusually sized and or shaped. And because of the wetlands raises, you know, some some interesting problems in trying to develop it. On the other hand, I agree with the Environmental Commission that that's probably why that was left as a 5.85 whatever acre lot instead of a, a three acre lot because of those difficulties. I think that's reasonable. And I noticed that I think if anybody really desperate to get another lot out of there, they could have moved to Ever Chippen Road by a few feet to the to the east. And because the Mr. Stein's lot across the side is larger, you know, substantially larger than three acre minimum and possibly could have carved two conforming lots out of there, but they didn't. So, um, so, so that said, I, I don't see the public, I, I don't see the public, uh, huge advances in the public benefit that certainly don't outweigh the negatives and the negative negatives related to the setbacks and the intent of the zoning laws. Um, you know, it is zoned RA 130. And yes, Mr. Newmark argues throughout all of these hearings individually that each one of the variances required is not very large. You know, 6% reduction in size and the lot that's 282 feet instead of 300 feet, whatever. But I agree with Mr. Benson and that you can't look at those in isolation. This is an attempt to subdivide a lot and make two lots out of it. And in order to do that, they require seven variances. And those variances end up with two non-conforming lots in, a in an area, in a neighborhood where none of the lots that to my knowledge, I think um, have, do not conform to any one of those. They conform in every respect. So you're making, you're going from one lot that it would be, might be difficult to build a conforming house, but you could, um, to two completely non-conforming lots when no other neighbor, with no other lot in the near, in that contiguous RA 130 zoning, I believe, there's a few grandfathered lots, but generally that is, is non-conforming in any respect. So I just, that, you know, those, it does substantially affect the character of the neighborhood and the minimus, in my opinion, advances of the public good certainly do not outweigh the, uh, the negatives. I would also point out, it seems to me that all those variances and these two lots would be perfectly conforming if this was an RA 85 uh, zoning. So in effect, if we approve this, it seems like we're kind of spot zoning. We're taking that one large RA-130 lot and, make, and, and effectively making it an RA-85 zone. So I have to uh, um, recommend against um, uh, approving this application. Thank you. Mr. Quillen. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, can you hear me all right? Yes, we can. I agree with the comments made by Mr. Bai and Ms. Wilson. Uh, I, I am opposed to this application. I think that even though it might be argued that each individual variance is not that disturbing, um, when taken together, they do paint a disturbing picture. Um, there is um, detriment to the MLUL, there's detriment to the neighborhood. And um, one thing that I think Mr. By and Ms. Ms. Wilson didn't mention was the lot width requirement. Uh, as Mr. Steck pointed out, the ordinance requires that the lot widths be measured, uh, the required lot width be measured at the required setback. Um, and um, that is a lot worse than a 6% uh, difference between what's required and what's um, the 300 foot that's required and the actual for the southerly uh, lot, the one with the peculiar shape. So these, um, these lot width requirements in the ordinance are an attempt to prevent folks from creating strange shaped lots. And I don't think we should be in the business of, of helping to, um, to create bizarre shaped lots. Uh, someone referred to it as gerrymandering. I think of that as a kind of a political concept, but it's certainly um, not attractive uh, to create uh, such odd shapes. So for that reason, and, and for all the other reasons previously mentioned, I'm, I'm opposed to this application. Any other board members want to weigh in? Perhaps I'll do that. Um, I agree with Mr. Newmark's assessment that individually these, these distances may seem de minimis or insignificant, but as has been stated, the reason we have all of these variances is because we're trying to squeeze two, um, two lots into one lot um, to avoid a very significant elephant in the room, which is the wetlands. There are three sets of wetlands, two significant wetlands. And I'm very concerned about the existing drainage situation and what further drainage situation is going to occur during construction and after construction. Um, we can't fight the water and we need to preserve those sensitive areas for our wildlife and for, for the benefit of the community. The, master plan is a very significant consideration in this decision and maintaining the water lands and maintaining the, the interest of the master plan and the zoning. Um, I find to be very, very important and I'm having a hard time seeing where the benefits outweigh the detriment to the master plan and to the zoning. Um, so I'm the DP, situation, there's a reason they hesitated to make a decision. Maybe they'll we'll make a decision if we approve this. Um, I'm having a hard time. There's a reason that they hesitated to, to, to give an approval on this application. Um, so like George said, it's a highly contorted um, configuration in order to benefit what appears to be the homeowner and I'm having a hard time figuring out what the benefit is to the community. Um, so that's kind of it, in addition to what others have said. Um, but I certainly will be willing to listen to other people. Mr. Flowers. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, my thinking is in line with uh, you, Ms. Wilson, Mr. Bai, Mr. Quillen. Um, I am also opposed to this application. I just don't see the, the public benefit. I don't see how it would advance the, um, uh, you know, the MLUL, uh, the highly skewed lot shape. Um, you know, it just, uh, you know, the, the entire neighborhood's against it. Um, and it just doesn't seem like a, a smart decision to me. That's all. Ms. Wilson, Ms. Murphy. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I just want to um, uh, go back to Mr. Alesso's comment um, in the beginning, which was um, having to do with the need for housing. And, and I will point out that the master plan does contemplate that we would be having uh, lot subdivisions and um, infill type of development and so on and so on. Um, so the, the, his point was actually um, correct. Uh, that said, my major concerns on this particular application have to do with uh, steep slopes and wetlands um, and sort of echoes, you know, a lot of the other comments that were um, stated already. So I won't belabor that. But um, I, um, I, I think I'm leaning um, toward a no vote as well. Any other members of the board? Um, no other members of the board, then I'll take a motion on the application. I'll move we deny the application. This is Rick By. I will Mr. second that. Thank you, Ms. Wilson. Roll call vote. Roll call vote. Mr. Quillen? Yes. Mr. Nunn? No. Mr. Flowers? Yes. Mr. Alesso? No. Ms. Murphy. I'm voting yes to deny. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Mr. Bai? Uh, yes to deny. Ms. Wilson. Yes. Ms. Van Order. Ms. Van Order, we didn't hear your vote. You're muted. Can you hear me? Yes. No. Oh, yes. Yes. Now we can. Okay. I'm voting no. Okay. Just for clarification, that's a no, meaning you're in favor of the application. So you're voting uh, no, not to deny it, correct? Thank you for clarifying, and that's correct. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Benoit. I vote yes to deny. Okay. That's uh, six. six to three, right? Yes. Motion to deny passes. Thank you very much. Hey, thank you, Mr. Mark. Um, thank you, board time. members. Thank you, Mr. Benson. Next on, on the agenda, other matters. Is there a legislative committee report? Yes, I think Mark and I both had something. Go ahead, Mark. Go ahead, Kathy, you can go first if you like. Okay, I'll just mention that the uh, League of Municipalities Legislation Committee is meeting for the first time since COVID in person on April 1st. So I'm looking forward to that. Um, I also wanted to mention to the board just briefly a heads up that the township is um, for the first time seeking to apply for certification through the Sustainable Jersey program. And there's going to be a few items that are going to uh, need to be brought um, to this board. Uh, we haven't decided yet if it's going to be a discussion or emails. I'm not exactly sure how we're going to do this. But just a little heads up, uh, we will be talking about uh, three things I wanna highlight. One is a sustainable land use pledge. Another is uh, improving public engagement in planning and zoning. And a third is complete streets. So um, just a little heads up, more to come um, on, those, on those three topics um, as part of our sustainable Jersey certification efforts. 
Thank you. That's all I've got. Um, and I'll just say, Mr. Chairman, um, to follow up on my report from last month dealing with um, our efforts to um, have the MLUL amended at the state level to provide for a 21 day notice requirement as opposed to the current 10 day notice requirement. Um, we have secured a prime sponsor to the bill uh, to introduce the bill in the state house. However, we are still um, trying to identify and find um, an additional sponsor from a different party. We'd like this uh, bill to be introduced bipartisanly uh, in the state house to secure its uh, support down the road. Um, and once we have a second sponsor from a different party lined up, then we'll um, provide more information. But we're optimistic about this and we're excited. And you know, you know, thanks to Kathy for all of her hard work since 2019 on this matter. And we're gonna continue pushing forward on it. Mark, did you say this was the 21 day thing? I didn't hear you say that if you did. Yes, that was uh, 21 okay, yeah, sorry. legislation to amend the MLUL to require a 21 day notice as opposed to the current 10 day notice. You need a sponsor in both houses of the legislature? Um, you don't necessarily, we're looking for um, a sponsor, both a Democrat and Republican sponsor. We'd like them, we'd like it to be a bipartisan bill. Uh, we have one member from one party on board. We're looking for another sponsor on the, in the other party. Great. Okay. Thank you. Um, we have a request. Any comments on the uh, legislative committee? We have a request for an extension. No. Okay, that's correct, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, Mr. Newmark uh, uh, provided the letter. I it may not be on anymore, but uh, it is an extension request and we don't necessarily, it's not a public hearing. We don't require applicants council uh, to be here for these. Um, as you're familiar, uh, the, uh, this was a 2019 approval development of an automobile dealership repair and service facility for Subaru of Morristown. Uh, along East Hanover Avenue to be used in conjunction with an adjacent Subaru dealership at 175 Ridgedale Avenue and 303 East Hanover Avenue corner. Um, and that 29, uh, 2019 approval uh, was good for, uh, well, two years, if you will, uh, regarding the site plan approval. Uh, the final approval was, which expired May uh, 5, 2021. <laughs> But a request was made, nunc pro tunc, as we lawyers like to use Latin every chance we get, um, after the fact, uh, for two one-year extensions. Uh, you can get up to three one-year extensions, actually. Um, and uh, the request was made for same, given the governmental restrictions imposed in the March, uh, excuse me, uh, uh, sin imposed since March of 2020 as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. As the board's also aware, uh, the, uh, there was a Permit Extension Act uh, specific to the COVID pandemic as well, um, but the applicant, uh, rather than um, bringing that into the analysis, just simply asked for the two one-year extensions, which would bring, bring us from May 5, 2021 to May 5, 2023, and the applicant has indicated that they'll be able to proceed uh, in time. Uh, uh, if they were given, afforded that extension. So we did draft a resolution memorializing that extension of approval if the board is so inclined, so they could adopt it this evening. Uh, and it would extend until May 5, 2023, subject to all of the same conditions as set forth in the original 2019 approval, if you deem that to be good cause for granting that extension. Can we get a motion on a resolution to extend until May 5, 2023? Mr. Mr. Chairman, I make a motion we extend the application until May 23. I have a second? I'll second. Mr. Nunn, second? And we should have a roll call vote since it's a resolution. Mr. Quillen? Yes. Mr. Nunn? Yes. Mr. D'Alessa? Yes. Ms. Murphy? Yes. Mr. Bai? Yes. Ms. Wilson? Yes. Mr. Dorothy? Yes. Ms. Van Orda? Yes. Mr. Benoit? Yes. So moved. At this point, we'll open up the um, 
meeting to members of the public who may have any public comments, preferably in the areas other than the application tonight. Um, any members wish to speak? Mr. Allen? I'm assuming it's a Mr. Allen. Oh, that's Allen. Okay. Yes. Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, thank you. Um, I'd like to uh, just in ultra brief, like to raise the issue of whether these meetings at the township continue in person and or virtual or both. Um, it matters to some of us, even though the uh, pandemic seems to be waning. Um, there's been some uh, discussion uh, and I would encourage you to solicit um, from the public um, their feelings on the subject. I'll give you an ultra brief mine. Um, and it's entitled The Value of Choice for Township Residents. Ms. Wilson, some years ago, experimented with bringing the township hearings and meetings to the local residents via cable TV. She was ahead of her time. The pandemic and technology have elevated her original purpose to near necessity currently. Just as corporations and businesses now permit both home offices and corporate offices, our township should revisit the advantages of choice for our residents to participate and learn about current issues and the mechanics of Morris Township. Currently, I, among others, who utilize uh, virtual to learn by way of monitoring. This evening, we heard two great summations from two talented councils. We take note of the subjects chosen and their importance. It is not our purpose to become land use lawyers or planners. We only hope to learn what germane questions to ask and to know enough to pose the, <clears throat> the follow-on questions if those become necessary. It is for others like you to decide the value of in-person and virtual participation here. However, by providing choice, we are likely to encourage the residential public to know more of and to participate broadly in township matters. Joyce puts the responsibility quite squarely in our residents' laps, and I think that's just where it belongs. Thank you very much. Thank you. This is a very important topic that we have been discussing. Would any board members like to address this? So it's something that the township committee. I think the option of having a hybrid format and giving even uh, not just members of the public, but also board members, the option of attending remotely or in person as we become more comfortable with in-person attendance uh, permanently into the future is a good idea. And thank you. Any other board members? Ms. Van Order's got her hand raised. Oh, I'm sorry, Ms. Van Order? Yes. Uh, can you hear me, Mr. Chairman? Yes, we can. Great. I, I have only attended this board remotely, and I have found it to be challenging, and I look forward to going back in, uh, to not going back, <laughs> to beginning, my, my beginning uh, of in-person, and I'm hoping that will come quickly. If it's possible to do it as a hybrid, I have no opposition to that. I, I would, you know, think about whether... That's the best thing for board members, though. I, I found it challenging. That's just been my experience. And I, uh, I am an executive director with a board in my work life, and uh, it's been challenging there as well. And we're going back in, in person, and, I'm, and I'm, everyone is quite happy about that, uh, just so that we can, uh, you know, we can generate the energy in the, in the room and, and really get away from the kind of glitches that we've seen. Um, there's been, I think, I can't compare what the time is usually like in person as compared to 
uh, online, but I've you know found a lot of delays uh, with technology glitches, and that's been a challenge for me. But thank you for um, all the efforts everyone's made to make this this important work continue during this time. Ms. Murphy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, as uh, most of you know, I'm a member of the Board of Education as well. We've been back in person for quite a period of time already um, and are meeting uh, in the auditorium of the high school with the public. Um, that said, I will tell you that I miss the uh, reach that we had when we were virtual um, at one point when we were talking about school reopening plans and COVID um, um, uh, rule guidance, uh, we we had at one point almost 500 people on a on a call uh, because so many people wanted to know what was going on and and the Zoom call actually was a wonderful way to reach all those folks, many of whom would not have been able to make it in person. I want to echo what uh, Tanya said, though the I I find the glitchiness of the online format to be quite frustrating. Um, you know, lots of problems hearing what people are trying to say, um, issues with delays of one type or another. And on uh, more than one occasion, we, uh, we had a failure of the entire system. So um, I, I would like to get back in person uh, as soon as feasible. Um, however, if there is a way technically to do a hybrid in a, in, in a way that doesn't interfere with the normal course of business in a planning board meeting, then I would support that. Um, I will be honest and say the school board has not figured that out yet. We've not figured out how to do both at the same time. Um, and even our teachers now, when they have remote uh, students, they, the students just observe. They're not able to really interact with the class because we We've not solved the technical problem, so I'll just leave it at that. Mayor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I agree. I think hybrid is the way of the future for all public meetings. Um, so as much as we can in terms of the MLU all what the state will allow us, I know the land use boards are different. Uh, from the township committee perspective, we um, intend to do hybrid meetings along with our advisory and volunteer boards that are not land use related. Um, but in order, as Linda was saying, in order to have a hybrid meeting, you have to have the technology in place so it's not glitchy, so you're not running into problems. Um, the township committee is aware of that. We've uh, budgeted um, money in this year's budget specifically related to IT upgrades, not only for the committee room where Ed is there and is now there with, um, with our professionals and Joe and Chief Nunn, but also our conference room number one as well. Um, the last thing from my perspective is that I want is to invite everyone back in person and not have the infrastructure there to support hybrid meetings. Um, I think if we were to go back too soon without the equipment in place, it will be glitchy. There'll be problems. People won't hear each other. Um, and when I'm talking about upgrades for our, for the chambers and for the conference rooms, I'm talking about large TV screens for people to see, um, whether they're in person or at home for, for people to see who's, people who are talking remotely to see the presentations on the, on, uh, that are being presented. Because quite frankly, um, depending on what the land use boards do, what the state allows, other, other, whether it's a committee meeting or a volunteer meeting, we have to acknowledge the fact that not everyone's gonna be there in person anymore. Whether they feel sick that day and they don't wanna come in or they're just not comfortable coming into a large setting anymore. Um, so we have to make sure on our side that we have everything in place to not only allow the people to come in person safely, but to allow those participating virtually to have as equal as an opportunity to participate as those in person. So um, it's high on our priority. Um, we are hopefully um, purchasing the equipment soon and I hope to have it up in the next few months. Um, and I think Steve would probably have a better say on whether or not the state's gonna allow us to be hybrid. Um, I'm hoping that we, at the very least, we can at least have the live stream while the planning board deliberates in person when that when the time comes. So far, so good. Uh, we could do in-person, remote, or hybrid. And, and as you say, Mr. Mayor, the, the, the technology is the key to giving ourselves, uh, particularly in the context of development application hearings before land use boards, since they're quasi-judicial, giving ourselves 
uh, uh, or allowing ourselves to be availed of all three options. Uh, so, okay, Ms. Wilson. I just want to clarify that point. That was my question. Um, it was my understanding before that the land use boards had to be either in person or virtual, but are you saying now that hybrid is uh, going to be allowed? Currently, we can do hybrid so long as, as the mayor said, we have the technology such that anyone who is remote can hear everything and see everything and be seen and be heard. Just like if, uh, uh, and vice versa, if you will, everyone in person. So it, we, we need that uh, two-way type of situation. Uh, in order to effectively have a hybrid. Otherwise, uh, we could be facing some uh, due process issues, uh, yeah. and which would limit us to either being all in person or all remote. Thank you. I will just add, I think, you know, the COVID has created a silver lining in uh, getting us to a place of being able to do meetings virtually. I don't think we would be doing this were it not that we were forced. And I do see certain advantages. You can see the application materials better frequently than from the meeting room. So um, anyway, I'm glad that we are moving toward hybrid and I'm looking forward to getting the equipment to support that. I would like to see us perhaps think about going in person on other things outside of our meetings. So I think there's a discussion to be had there. And I would also just add that um, it is my understanding and perhaps Mark, you can comment on that, on this, that um, I haven't seen this myself yet, but it is my understanding that we are posting some of our uh, land use board meetings on our YouTube site. Is that correct? That's correct. The uh, January and February planning board meetings are on uh, our YouTube page, Morris Township Videos, which thankfully you started years ago and now we've taken over. Um, but um, the, the planning board uh, meetings are, the recordings are being posted on YouTube for now on. All right. And that's something we can let the public know um, in case they're interested because it's, it's, it's pretty brand new. So anyway, thank you. Any other members of the public have a comment? If not, we'll close the public portion. Um, we do have to address what's next meeting. Yeah, I was just gonna say, we, uh, I believe Sonia has a list of uh, items that may be on for the next couple of meetings. So I have for the uh, Lord Jim. 321 meeting uh, and a management, which is a reuse of the uh, TD Bank building on Madison Avenue. For the April 4th meeting, um, it looks like we're going to have the Morris County Golf Club. I think we may just be waiting for uh, some more uh, information on that, but it looks like that meeting will be for the uh, golf course, the new maintenance building and uh, halfway house and the 18th is anticipated to be the Savage subdivision. They've been pushing that off. They want to get their uh, NJDEP approvals in advance of the meeting, but uh, they thought that there's a chance that they may uh, have those permits from DEP for the April 18th meeting. Okay, thank you. It's nice to have the advanced knowledge of these meetings. Um, should we address the, the next meeting, the chairmanship? I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. The chairmanship is the next meeting. Oh, we, oh, thank you. I did forget. Yes, we, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, we uh, realized uh, that our chair will not be here on March 21st, and our vice chair uh, will be recusing himself from that matter. Uh, so we do not have a, a vice chair pro tem, uh, i.e., a number three. Uh, to fill that void, at least not as of yet. Uh, perhaps we can uh, come up with our candidate uh, and we can have an election uh, so that we have a chair in place at least for March 21, our next meeting. And so, I believe, yeah, Mr. Chairman, did you have anyone in mind who well, might be willing to be that uh, vice chair? I was chair thinking of Mr. Bai, but if others are willing or if Mr. Bai is willing, 
Um, it appears as though we'll just have the one application that night and we should probably be able to finish it that night. And certainly um, before the meeting, Mr. Warner and myself can, can, can brief this person on what to expect. And it's probably something everyone should do once in a while. <laughs> so well, we certainly if, like to volunteer. It, yeah, if the rest of the board yeah, is okay with it. I yeah, I'll, I would agree to do it on the twenty first. There you go. Thank you, Mr. Bai. I'd like to make a motion. We nominate Mr. Bai as our vice chairman pro tem. And I'll second it. There we go. On the roll, should we just a voice vote? Uh, you know what? A uh, uh, quick roll. Well, you know what? A voice vote is fine. Voice vote is fine. It may be unanimous. All in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Okay, motion carries. Thank you, Mr. Bai. Um, Thank you, I think. <laughs> <laughs> there is no closed session. Any no make closed. motion we adjourn. Second to that. I'll second. I suppose all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Yeah. No opposed. Also. Thank you, everyone. To Thank you, everyone. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.